Okay, so we're gonna. I'm sorry, we're gonna try again. Not that it means anything to you, but this is my second go at this. Um, I this is my living room. Um, uh, I can't do it from the kitchen today because there are people doing construction in the courtyard, and uh, it's too noisy. So, um, yeah, that's that. Also, I don't have any pants on. Um, uh, so there's a few things that I want to talk about. Um, because they came to me in emails, uh, from, uh, more than one student. And I want to just quickly go over these things so that we're all on the same page. The first has to do with the order of the readings. Uh, we are sticking with the order of the syllabus. This does, is not, should not be an issue, uh, for you in comedy as we are still basically on schedule. Um, and you will get the most out of the lectures if you read the work before you watch the lecture. Because I'm not going to go point, you know, I, I don't go point by point in terms of the plot. I expect that you already know that. <clears throat> um, I have opened all the courses on Blackboard. Um, not... <laughs> Blackboard and CUNY first were both down for several days because uh, they couldn't deal with the traffic. And um, now they're back up. So just earlier today, I opened the, the, the Blackboard and the, and the CUNY first. Well, CUNY first doesn't matter to you, but Blackboard matters to you. Um, so I'll both be emailing you the, the uh, link to the lecture and at the same time also uh, be... Uh, still doing what I did the last time, which is just emailing it to you. And I mean, I think basically that's it. Again, I want to repeat, if you have any questions regarding the lecture, please send it to my Brooklyn College email. Do not send it to the Gmail email atta attached to this YouTube account. I'll look at that. I only set it up to make it possible to open this channel up. Um, so, uh, send it, yeah, right, send it to the Brooklyn College email address. Okay, good, that's good. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Due dates, I talked to you about that in the last email. Uh, yeah, and that's basically it for that. Okay, so let's talk about what we have to talk about today, which is Theophrastus and Menander. Um, We'll start with Theophrastus, uh, and is um, I put selections uh, from his work, the characters or the eight, to give it its proper its proper title, Aetha koi characteres, which in Greek means uh, the nature, the nature of. I think probably the best term in that context of character is personality. Right, so we talk about character, right? And this is a word that we use all the time in English when we talk when we talk about somebody's basic, you know, personality or their the way that they work, or to put it another way, their basic ethos. So what does ethos mean? Ethos means your way of life. Um, and when we talk, I mean, like, it, it sounds like a kind of an abstract, uh, it, it sounds like a kind of an abstract idea, but think about it. I mean, what is your way of life? You get up at a X time, you take the subway to X place, you go to work, you come back, you cook your dinner, or you go to school, and you come back, and you have somebody who cooked dinner for you, maybe, um, and, um, and you, you know, you do certain things at certain times. That's all of that is involved in your ethos, and but it also extends to the way that you interact with the larger community too, um, and with the people around you. 
So the ethekoi uh, characteres um, means the ethos of the character. So what the the by the way, what the offertist does is uh, he breaks down different character types. Now let me I, I mean I want to talk about uh, him. I want to talk about Theophrastus just for a minute here. Um, just so you know who he was and and uh, he was not an Athenian. He was born outside of Athens. He came to Athens. He studied at Plato's Academy uh, for a period and then Plato died and then he uh, transferred, I guess is the word that we would use these days, to uh, uh, Aristotle School in the Lyceum. So we read the clouds, we read about Socrates. Socrates himself never had a school per se. But Plato, his, uh, um, I suppose now what we would call his star pupil, though, you know, who knows, um, did start a school. He did start a formal school. Um, and so what we're looking at there is Plato's school was called the Academy. Sorry, I'm still doing this mirror image thing the wrong way. <laughs> so there's the Academy. That's Plato's school. Right, and then uh, Aristotle came to study at the academy, and uh, was their star pupil, and wanted to be uh, the kind of like you know top um, administrator at the school, and was passed over for it, uh, um, in uh, for the sake of Plato's nephew. His name was Spusippus, don't worry, I'm never going to ask you to remember that name. But uh, yeah, um, so uh, Aristotle got pissed off and he, walked, he went off and started his own school. And that school was called the Lyceum. Over here, here it is, Lyceum. So these, both these words still survive into English these days. We still talk about the academy. Uh, the French word for school is lycée. Uh, so, um, yeah, they're both uh, still viable linguistic constructs, I guess is all I'm saying here. Uh, but when Aristotle went off to found the Lyceum, it was a little bit different because Aristotle's approach to understanding and to learning was different from um, Plato's uh, and, and the Platonic Socratic tradition, which um, basically uh, basically founds itself on ideas of um, abstracted ideals. There, there is a beauty. There is an art. Or I said shit. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is an abstracted idea of beauty. There is an abstracted idea of art. And uh, uh, these things are permanent and unchanging. And all we can hope to do is uh, think about them enough until we get to an understanding of what they mean. Now, Aristotle's approach was different. Aristotle uh, was much more about uh, what you can touch, taste, feel, sense. Right? Okay, so here we go. Now I'm going down the hole. I'm not going to go too far down this hole because I know I have to get back to comedy at some stage. By the way, if you notice, I still have not put pants on. Um, I'm going to give you some philosophy terms here. A couple at least. Now, I'm 
might as well started writing, I might as well finish. Okay, so I'm not going to go quite in order in the way that I wrote the words down here, but I'll put it up anyway. So we're going to start with ontology, which is, I just can't get the left-right symmetry right. Okay, so we're going to start with this word. This word is ontology, okay? So ontology deals with the theory of the things that actually exist. And uh, so, so ontos in Greek, ta, ta ontos means those things that are, that they actually exist. It's like a rock or a brick or your, sorry, I'm looking out my window now, fire escape or, uh, uh, you know, the things that you stub your toe on or that you bump your head on. Like these are ontos. These are things that actually exist. So ontology means the philosophy of things that actually exist. And so then we get into the idea of how do we how do we know? So now I'm coming back. I'm coming up here to epistemology. And epistemology is the philosophy of how do we actually know that the things that we think we know exist in fact actually exist. So, yeah, down the rabbit hole. Is it all a dream? Did I just dream and I bumped my head? It felt real in my dream. Yeah, whatever. We know when we bump our heads and when we don't. Uh, but that's another, that's a conversation in another context. So, epistemology is how we know the things that we know. Okay. So, Plato and Aristotle, they had a fundamental disagreement. There was a, there's a fundamental gap between the way Plato approaches philosophy and the way Aristotle approaches philosophy. For Plato, the ontology, the things that actually exist, means that uh, you can build an argument uh, that will conclusively prove uh, that the things you think exist do in fact actually exist. So it's based on uh, it's based on theoretical argument. Aristotle, on the other hand, um, though not necessarily to the extent that we do these days, but 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 certainly um, as a precursor to what we do these days, felt that like well we should probably maybe rely more on what we see and feel and hear and taste and smell. Like maybe we should just trust these things as real, and. Uh, Forget it, like, well, not totally, like, not, no, I'm sorry. I went too far there. Not forget about the theoretical arguments, but, like, let's take these things into consideration, right? So this is, this is where we get into um, phenomenology. I'll write it here. I'll try to keep it on the page. not succeed. <laughs> All right, let me grab a new page here. Um, not that one. This is, okay, so this is, this is the beginnings of, of the uh, philosophy of phenomenology. Where does this word come from? <laughs> it comes from the Greek word. I'm going to show you this, and you can see how crappily I wrote the other word a second ago. Phenomena. Phenomena means the things that appear to you. 
Uh, phino is a Greek word um, that means uh, to appear. Uh, it literally means to shine forth. It's the word that you would use when you light a candle. Um, uh, and but it means to appear, to make evident, to be evident, to be to be there, to be present. Um, so Aristotle's bag was about phenomenology, and he uh, his school proved to be uh, pretty popular. Um, in fact, at one point, it, I from what I've read, it it, it almost put. Uh, Plato's Academy out of business. I mean, Plato's whole philosophy is built on the idea of if you don't know math, don't come here. Like you had to pass, you basically had to pass a math entrance exam to get into the academy. Um, and math at that stage meant uh, higher levels of geometry. So you had to be able to prove volumes and all that stuff that we don't really think about anymore. Not that I'm not dismissing Plato. Plato. There's many brilliant things in Plato and many joys in reading Plato and many frustrations as well, as there are in Aristotle. Aristotle's writings are, which are numerous, er, we have tons of Aristotle that survives um, um, compared to other ancient authors. Um, and much of it is very boring. Uh, Aristotle wrote on all kinds of subjects. He wrote on the soul, he wrote on the weather, he wrote on uh, animals. In fact, Aristotle gave us our first ever, uh, I, I think, I could be wrong on this, but as far as I know, Aristotle gave us our first ever uh, system of um, being able to understand animals by their species. So what Aristotle did was he divided them into four classes. He said uh, there are two kind. There, 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 there are well, basically there's 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 two categories of, of understanding animals. Okay, one category is how they walk around. The other category is how they bear their young. So in the first category about how they walk around is whether they go on two feet or four feet. In the second category about how they bear their young is whether they lay eggs or whether they give birth to live babies. And so that gives you four total categories, right? So you've got two-footed animals that lay eggs, like a chicken. Um, and then you've got and then you've got four-footed animals uh, that lay eggs uh, like lizards and like, uh, well, not that Aristotle would have ever known about the platypus, but like the platypus. Um, and then you have two-footed animals. Wait, I just did two-footed animals. Wait, no, wait, I just did eggs. Wait, what did I just say? Uh, eggs. Was I on the eggs thing? So chickens and platypi, uh, they lay eggs. And wait, no, yeah, okay, great. Now I'm confused. Now I've confused myself. All right, so let me go back to the feet. So you got four-footed animals that give birth to live young. That's like cows or sheep. And then you've got two-footed animals that give birth to live young, like humans. Uh, and then you've got four-footed animals that lay eggs, like platypi or lizards. And then you've got two-footed animals that lay eggs, for their young, like chickens. I love chickens. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, uh, so, but I'm only saying this. The only reason why I'm getting into this, it, this none of this is like intensely important for you to know. Uh, but the but the reason why I'm getting into this is because the, I, I'm, what I'm trying to lay out is Aristotle's systematic way of thinking. Right? Things go into boxes, things go into categories, and we can understand things as we see them and experience them and put them into, you know, this thing was that, but not this, so this goes into this box, but this thing was this, but not that, so that goes into this box, but this thing was both that and this, so this thing goes into this box. And that's kind of the way Aristotelian philosophy uh, unfolds itself. It's a gross oversimplification.
education. And I apologize to any of you who are actually seriously studying uh, philosophy. Um, but yeah. Anyway, in any case, getting back to Theophrastus. Theophrastus started his studies. He was not an Athenian, came to Athens, started his studies at the academy. Plato died. Things changed. He transferred to the Lyceum. He studied under Aristotle. And so Theophrastus' own way of thinking shows uh, a good deal of uh, the same tendencies towards systematization and blocking things off. And that's where we come to the characters. I told you I was going to come back to this sooner or later. Um, so let's talk about Theophrastus for a second. Uh, Theophrastus was born in 371. Uh, died in the 290-somethings, no, I'm sorry, 287 uh, are the dates that are given for Theophrastus. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, where's my glasses? Now i got to read my notes. He, yeah, like I said, he was a uh, uh, student of Aristotle's, uh, and there are, there are, there is uh, there is evidence that Theophrastus was formerly a teacher of Menander, um, but I mean, what is indisputable is the fact that they were very close acquaintances. Um, I I mean I don't Menander was a rich kid too, so like you know he could go wherever he wanted and do whatever he wanted, so it's. Uh, um, might have been a might have been a student might have been a student of Theophrastus, but was certainly a, 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 a close friend of his. So they would have talked about things. So when we look at the characters of Theophrastus, what we see is this tendency to start putting people, or not people, um, but what we start to see is like. I suppose looking at the the people we meet as fitting into a certain type of person, and then they and then they're that type of person, right? So this is going to filter it into comedy, um, in the sense that uh, when when we start when we get to Menander, I'm going to get to Menander in just a second, but when we get to Menander, we're going to see that like. There are people that, like the characters don't really have personalities per se. They have they they, they all kind of conform to. Uh, they come on stage in a particular uh, costume. Uh, they come on stage with a particular mask, and the audience can immediately identify them. Oh, this is the this is the uh, uh, wealthy young man. Oh, this is the servant. Uh, who works in the house. Oh, this is the cook. Um, or this is the servant who works in the field. Uh, or this is the dad. Or this is the mom figure. And, and, and so there's a, there's, this is a sort of tendency. This is why I wanted you to read passages out of Theophrastus, is so that you could um, uh, kind of understand where this tendency builds from. Um, this, this, this idea that we like people go in boxes and we can think of them as this and we can think of them as that. So it's a movement away from Aristophanes, right? And Aristophanes, he names names. Like you have to know uh, that Kinesius was uh, reportedly uh, uh, reportedly like butt sex. Like you, you had to know, you know, that, you, well, what, like, you know, Cleon was who Cleon was. You had to know who Socrates was, right? You had to know who was a drunk and who, you know, what people's public reputations were. Um, because it was very immediate. It was very political with Aristophanes. Um, so I'm, I'm stepping, I'm just a half step ahead of myself here. Uh, but I will put this up now. This has to do with a thing that we talk, we've already talked two thirds of the way about in class, which has to do with the development of comedy in the ancient Greek world. 
so I don't I don't know how long I have to hold this up for, but I think this should be pretty evident. <laughs> it goes from old to middle to new. Like that seems like it should be a thing that is not something I need to over explain. So when we look at old comedy, we're talking about Aristophanes, we're talking about how topical he is, um, and how immediately political he is. And then we talked about a couple of Aristophanes plays, um, The Assemblywomen and The Well, where uh, Aristophanes kind of, for reasons that we've discussed in class, and I'm going to go over again in just a second, that, that he sort of backs away. Well, I don't even know that he backs away. I mean, it's just, it seems more like it's just a kind of a cultural condition that happens. I don't necessarily think that Aristophanes' society was not going to make any more political references anymore. I don't think, it, I don't think we have to read it that way. But um, that's the middle comedy. And then when we get to Menander, we get to the new comedy. So that means that what I have to talk about now, having got off Theophrastus, uh, or I'm not totally off Theophrastus, he's got the gossip, the miser, the miser. Remember that one. He's going to come back. Uh, the the buffoon. Uh, um, where I come from, uh, which is southwestern Pennsylvania, we call this guy Jagoff. J-A-G-O-F-F. -F. Um, Jagoff. Uh, uh, stupidity, superstitiousness, that's another subject we're going to come back to when we get to Roman tragedy. Um, arrogance needs no explanation. Cowardness again, yeah, and meanness, and yeah. So, like, so he's boxing these characters off, right? Which is different to, uh, well, again, sorry, I don't mean to repeat myself, but I'm going to. Uh, that what we learn in Aristophanes, or what not what we learn, but what we read in Aristophanes, uh, where he deals with very specific individuals um, uh, and names them by name and doesn't back off from them. So we have to answer the question: Why is that? Why 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 does comedy go from uh, intensely personally political? to this sort of like, hey, this guy's like this, you know, hey, here's the cook, ha, 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 we know what the cook's going to do. Here's a slave, ha, 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 we know what the slave's going to do. Here's a dad, ha, 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 we know what the dad's going to do. Like, how, where does that shift happen in comedy? And to, in order to understand that, we have to, we kind of have to understand the political uh, development that happened in Athens, okay, and the, and the timeline. So this is important. This is a, so uh, uh, perk up if you've nodded off, because these are things that I'm going to be asking you about uh, later uh, in your papers or on your exams. Okay, so one of the things that we have to think about is the development, the historical development of Athens. Um, and by development, I mean the, I don't mean development as in like they got better. I mean like the way things turned out for them. So. When you look at Athens in the 440s, 430s, and even into the 420s, and even halfway through the 14s, uh, Athens is winning. They're winning all the way. They they never got sick of winning, uh, but they uh, they uh, they were on the up and up the whole way. Their navy was dominant. They had total control of the seaway, certainly in the entirety of the Western Mediterranean. Um, and uh, they controlled the uh, input-output from the Black Sea, which was important because there's tons of there's tons of natural resources, and there still are tons of natural resources um, all up that sea. And uh, but then they uh, kind of overshot their mark in the in when they decided to invade Sicily in 415. And they ended up losing the Peloponnesian War. We've been over most of this material already, so I won't repeat it to you now. Uh, and uh, things got bad in Athens. 
Egypt's, they basically, they went broke. They lost their empire. Um, they lost their navy in the Sicilian expedition. And with losing their navy, they lost their ability to uh, uh, exploit their uh, economy as well as exploit their enemies, not their enemies, their allies, actually. I'm sorry, I said enemies, I actually meant allies, uh, whom they were, had been squeezing for 20, 30 years prior to this. So, uh, uh, so Athens was in a bad state. And so, like, when we think about this historical development in the history of comedy, we think about Athens and its ability to uh, self-determine which means that, like, you know, you look at the 440s, 430s, 420s, when the Athenian assembly meets and when they take votes on things and when they elect, elect their officials and when they uh, propose laws and when they vote on those things, you know, this is, a, this is a thing that the city, the polis, the city state itself has a direct uh, say over, right? But when you get back, when you get down to the end of the Peloponnesian War, when you get down to the you know, 4-4, four, 4-3, four, 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 one in that range, Athens isn't making its own decisions internally anymore. Uh, yeah, they reinstate the democracy, in, I think, in 403 officially, but, you know, it doesn't, it takes a while. Um, and uh, so, uh, I think, for me and my theory uh, about the development of comedy is that um, the loss of direct influence over Athenian political life led to a loss of interest. And the jokes aren't funny anymore. Who cares if you make fun of so-and-so? Who cares? No one cares. He doesn't have any say over anything. You know, and so what happens is, and this is the movement I'm sorry, I'm not done yet. This is how we move from the old comedy of Aristophanes to what we call the middle period of Aristophanes. Right? So what, as you look at a play like, you know, The Clouds or The Birds, uh, or, or even The Frogs, which is relatively late, you still have these very immediate uh, references to Athenian life and Athenian political life. Um, even if the frogs, uh, even if the frogs lends itself to a bit of nostalgia, uh, but it's but it's re it's nostalgia for a reason, guys. Right? So Euripides has only been dead for a year, so it's not like nostalgia, nostalgia, nostalgia. But still, uh, you can already. But the frogs is permeated with death. I mean, it takes place in the underworld, so. There's that. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, where was I going with this? No, I've totally lost my track. Oh, yeah, Athenian political history. So, when you get down to the time uh, of Menander, so I gave you three Theophrastus dates. Let me give you Menander's dates. Uh, Menander was born, whoops, wrong one with pen. And died now these dates of course are not gospel truth they're based on the best sources that we have and the and uh, and some of those are uh, dubious. So, uh, but it gives us a good framework to understand what's going on here. So, let me uh, talk about what happens between Aristophanes and Menander. Um, so Aristophanes dies in the 380s, and uh, at that stage, uh, Athens is and never will be what it was um, in the in the 
450s, 440s, 430s, etc. You've already heard me say that already. Uh, and in fact, the, the Greek world remains in turmoil uh, for a long period of time. Uh, it, go, it experiences a series of hegemonies. So I know I gave you this word already, but I'll put it up again. Oops, let me get it on screen. Hegemony. This word basically means authority, leadership, autonomy. Like it, it, it's a word that's applied to a uh, power that doesn't have any kind of official or elected position, but everyone knows is in charge. Is the hegemony. So we go through a period of hegemonies. I'm going to run down these real quick for you. Um, so. Uh, I'm not going to write them down or put them up on the screen, but you can look these up uh, if you want to do further research, or you could just uh, rewind the video. That would work, too. Okay. So from 395 uh, to 386, we have the Spartan hegemony. Not surprising. Uh, Spartans came out victorious in the Peloponnesian War. They flexed their muscles somewhat, and so the rest of the Greek city-states uh, formed an alliance against them, including Greek city-states that were not allied during the Peloponnesian War. Uh, then you have the, uh, then Thebes becomes the most powerful. So you have a Theban hegemony. Uh, uh, there's a period where the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, wait, I skipped over this, sorry, 395. So after the war, so there's the Corinthian hegemony after the Spartan hegemony is broken. So the Corinthians, I said don't write it down, rewind it, and I screwed it up right away. Right. So you get the Spartan hegemony, then you get the Corinthian hegemony, then you have the Theban hegemony, then you have, I mean, the, the wars just go on and on through this whole period. I, I don't, I'm not going to list them all. But uh, again, so, uh, well, I will list them for you real quick. If you want to look them up, it's worth looking at. Okay. Corinthian War, Theban War, then you have what's called the Social Wars. Uh, then you have the, the Sacred Wars. Now, there are three Sacred Wars. Uh, and this is the third one. Uh, and then you have, well, and then you have the point where I'm, I, I am coming to here, which is where... Well, all the time the Southern Greeks are fighting in between themselves, the Northern Greeks are, are consolidating. Um, and that means King Philip II of Macedon. Okay, so King Philip II. Now, King Philip I was back in the 600s, okay? And we're not going to talk about him. So I'm just going to say King Philip from now on. Uh, but it is technically King Philip II, so just so that we're straight on that. Uh, he slowly makes his way southward into mainland Greece, uh, conquering basically city by city. And by the year 338, so when our boy Menander is about four years old, uh, Mas uh, the Macedonians have conquered everything. Uh, that includes Sparta, Athens, all of it. They control all of it. Now, 338, uh, I think that's the year uh, Philip dies. Uh, it's not that year. It's right around that year. Um, which leaves all this conquered territory to his son, whom some of you might have heard of already. His name is Alexander, Alexander the Great, uh, who, of course, will go on to conquer what at that time was the entire known world. Um, yeah. And then uh, in 323, he dies. So 15 years later. Uh, but a remarkable career. By the way, just to tie this back into Theophrastus and, uh, and Aristotle, supposedly, well, not supposedly, it, this, is prob this is generally regarded as true. Aristotle left Athens to go back to Macedon to tutor Aristotle. So Aristotle was Alexander's teacher. And there are letters that exist, even still today, that are supposedly between Aristotle and Alexander. Uh, I'm not an expert in those things, how far the experts 
think that those things are genuine or not, um, I don't know, um, but I generally think that they're not really real. Uh, yeah, so, but in, in any case, so there is a, there, you know, circle of life continues. Uh, so let's get to Menander then. Let's get down to Menander and get down to new comedy and the things I want to talk about new comedy. So the arbitration was the uh, assigned reading for today. The arbitration does not exist in its entirety anymore. It may be discovered. Uh, discoveries happen all the time. Um, Menander is uh, uh, the principal case uh, in this, in the sense that, um, so Menander, Menander was hugely popular. He was hugely popular, not just with the Greeks, but also with the Romans. So after Alexander invades, uh, you know, or what well, he invades, he takes over all of Greece, uh, and then you're under the Alexandrian thing, and then you're under the post-Alexandrian, because it breaks up into uh, four different chunks. And, uh, um, but then eventually the Romans are going to roll in and uh, take everything over. It won't be too long now, um, about 100 years, 150 years or so. Um, uh, and, uh, I can't remember what was on that. Oh yeah. Okay. But, okay. So having said that, all right. Okay. I remember what I was talking about. The popularity of Menander. Right. Uh, Menander, and I know why I mentioned the Romans because Menander will be enormously popular with the Romans. We'll deal with that when we get to Roman comedy. Uh, but the um, uh, uh, upshot of what I'm saying here is Menander was very popular in his own time. He wasn't the he wasn't the most popular. He had a rival called Philemon uh, who uh, won more first prizes than he did. Um, and uh, but but n n nobody bothered. So when we talk about the survival of ancient texts, that it's a function of how popular they were. I mean, just think about it for a second. If you, you know, two thousand years from now, when people dig up what what's left of New York City, what what newspapers are they going to find? They're going to find like the New York Post. They're going to find the New York Times. You know, they're going to find the newspapers that were the most popular. They're going to find the most popular readings that that, that were around. At the time, and that's the same general uh, profile that we deal with when we deal with uh, archaeological texts. However, with Menander, it's a little the story is a bit funnier because Menander was so popular and everybody loved him so much that every like all the all the literary critics and all the uh, commentators all talked about how great Menander was. Uh, there was one who said, oh, Menander, oh, life. And there was another who said, uh, what reason is there to go to the theater except to see Menander? Uh, so, you know, he, he, was, he was bigly popular. Um, and, uh, and, but the thing about it is, is that his works disappeared for a long period of time. All we had were quotations and fragments, and um, so it was like, oh, what did we lose with Menander? What did we lose with Menander? And then we discovered whole manuscripts of Menander. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, now, before I get into this, I'm going to just, I'm going to quote a scholar uh, uh, by the name of Eric Segal, who summed this up. Uh, better than I ever could. Uh, and his phrase was, uh, for a long time, the problem was that we didn't have any men, any men, <clears throat> see, I'm s sorry, Eric, he's dead now. Um, okay, so Seagal's quote was, uh, for the longest time, the problem was <clears throat> that we didn't have any men in. And then the problem was that we did have Menander. <laughs> Why does he say that? Because when we read Menander, we find that comedy has changed quite significantly. 
It's gone from the raucous, musical, scatological, um, uh, uh, X-rate, uh, or uh, PG-13, I don't know, R-rate, X-rated uh, romps of Aristophanes, political romps of Aristophanes, into this um, milieu of middle-classness. Menander's characters are, uh, uh, they're basically middle class. Oh, by the way, I should mention, one of, I, I, just by way of telling you a quick story here, one of Menander's manuscripts was found as packing paper. Uh, there was a crew unpacking a sarcophagus from Egypt, um, and as they took out the uh, papyri that was used to, as packing paper, you know, the way that you would send a, you know, gift package to somebody and stuff newspaper in it, right? Um, of course, all these things are, are precious. We want to see what's written on all of them. And as it turns out, one of, one of the sarcophag sarcophagi happened to have a, a, a nearly complete manuscript of Menander. So that, I mean, again, that tells you, like, like you know, what are you gonna stuff your your package when you send somebody when you send it to somebody or when you when you're burying your sarcophagus like what you're not gonna tear up your most precious manuscript you're gonna tear up something that you can get uh, pretty freely and easily uh, so that's a good that's a, a again you know that tells you about the popularity of Menander by the way Euripides was also hugely popular during the same time period. I will talk a little bit about the influence of Euripides on Menander um, uh, 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 in a couple of minutes. Uh, so, uh, um, so things are like so. When you look at a plot, so let's go to the arbitration then, right? Uh, did I talk? Uh, am I done talking about Menander? Supposedly, Menander d drowned when he was swimming. Um, uh, I mean, you can't really trust ancient biographies. Um, but he was pretty popular, and he remained popular, and he will remain popular throughout the tradition of comedy. There's a, a lot of difficulty in dating the specific plays because we don't have any real reliable direct information about these things. Um, but you can pretty much imagine that they were written between the 320s BCE and the, and the 290s BCE. Uh, which is a good time frame. Okay. So let's talk about the arbitration uh, for just a second. Now the arbitration, in the arbitration, we're dealing with um, a, a lost baby who no one knows who is the real parents for. Gee, where did that plot come from? Hmm, I don't know. Is that vaguely familiar to the Ion? Kind of, sort of. Um, so there's this lost baby, and he's found by one slave, uh, but he's also at the same time uh, claimed by another slave. So there's like sort of two dynamics here that they're arguing over here. It's who gets the baby versus who gets what was left with the baby, like the, the, the stuff that was left with the baby. Now, it should not surprise you, and indeed it will turn out in the play, that the things that were left with the baby are just as important in, in some respects as the baby itself. Because you got the baby, but the baby is the baby. And the baby doesn't mean anything on its own because you can claim that any the baby is anybody's baby. <clears throat> right? This is pre-DNA testing, right? We're not gonna we can't go on Mori and, and find out who the real dad is, right? So what matters. Or one of the things that matters, sorry, excuse me. One of the things that matters is possession of what the baby had with him, which will, in the end, I'm sure, and this should not be a surprise to you at this stage, will prove to be the recognition tokens uh, for the child. Um, uh, so what we're dealing with here, and I'm going to, sorry, I know I don't want to run on too long. I'm going to try to wrap this up. Because as soon as I start talking about something, I go on for 20 minutes, and I understand that. So what what I want to come back to here is Theophrastus and the idea of types 
right? Theophrastus putting people in these different boxes. You know, this guy's the jerk. This woman is, is too vain. Um, you know, this guy boasts all the time. You know, this person flatters you, uh, even though they don't really mean it. So there's all these different boxes that he puts people into. And you can kind of see this in, in the way that Menander's comedy is going, in the sense that, like, again, we're not dealing with political themes. Uh, we're, we're moving more towards, I put this on the board already, I'll write it again. One of the main shifts from old comedy via middle comedy into new comedy is the shift from the political to the domestic. So this play doesn't have any, this is not like the assembly women where it's about what, and the assembly women, I use that specifically because that's a middle comedy, right? So, but even there, it's still about the way that the city functions, right? And, even, and, and, and the frogs too. Like it's about what affects the city. How do we, how do we make the city better? Sorry, I see the glare on my glasses. Let me take these off. Um, so it's about, you know, it's how, how does the city function? So it's a political sort of thing. How do we interact with Athens? After Athens falls, and we move into the period where Athens is kind of displaced. Now Athens does, does, is still an influencer. <laughs> Uh, Athens still influences what happens uh, in and around the Mediterranean um, and uh, uh, does come back to a certain level of power, but, but never ever like it was back in the day. Uh, but the point of the matter is, is that as the Macedonians come southward, uh, and certainly by Menander's lifetime, Athens is no, like, you don't have, you're not making your own decisions anymore. Like, you can't decide to use the Athenian navy to do X, Y, or Z unless you go through Alexander and Alexander's officials first. Like you're not, you can't just, you know, choose to, to, to have this person or that person, you know, on your, on your council because they, it ha like, it's all sort of overseen by the Alexandrian uh, government. So there's a, so what I, my argument what are the argument that I'm going to make? And again, I'm going to I'm going to mention Eric Segal again. Um, and my, this my argument here is deeply influenced by arguments that he made. Is that uh, uh, you know when you lose your your uh, political your sense of like direct political influence, like when you realize that you yourself as an individual cannot be the direct shaper of your own immediate personal circumstances uh, then concomitantly or, or, or coordinately uh, comedy shifts too. So comedy becomes no longer about specific politicians. You can't crack jokes about Alexander. You can't crack jokes about Philip because they'll get back. And then, and then there's no, like, it's not like Aristophanes when Cleon, when Cleon sues him and Aristophanes wins, is acquitted by the Athenian courts in the 420s. That, that's not there anymore, right? It's top-down decision-making at this stage. So comedy changes, too. So what can we make jokes about? We can make jokes about family situations. We can make jokes about how frustrated we are with our slaves. So we get character types in this play, right? We get this, we get Davos, this, the, the scheming slave. He's going to come back again and again, not just the character type, but actually the name, Davos, that actually becomes the name for that character type. Uh, who else do we have? We have, uh, uh, well, yes, we have rape, um, which doesn't happen course in the play but happened before the play it's kind of a framing reference um, and I'm going to leave discussion of that until we get to Roman comedy um, <clears throat> we have uh, 
Pavro Tonon, who is the key, one of the key players uh, in the work, in the sense that uh, she she is the one who manufactures the recognition scene in the end, right? But what is Haber Tonon? She's a Hetaira. I think I gave you. Uh, well, maybe I didn't give you this one, so I'll give it to you now. She's a Hetaira. Now, this word means um, just, uh, just uh, on its face, just as a, like a as as just as a bare meaning. The word means a uh, female companion or a female friend, but in colloquial speech, it's used to mean a female companion. <laughs> Uh, um, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word prostitute here because our English word prostitute doesn't cover the same meaning uh, field that the Greek word hetaira does. Uh, but she was uh, usually a non-citizen woman. Uh, and as a non-citizen woman, ironically, she had greater freedom of movement and interaction within the city than a citizen woman did. Uh, because higher moral standards were expected of the citizen woman. Uh, but Habertonum is a tyra, um, and she's the one who facilitates, in the end, the recognition scene. Um, so uh, this character is... Uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to this again. Uh, but this character type, the Hatira, becomes a figure... that we will meet, or we already have met, throughout the Western comet tradition. Probably the most famous example is the movie uh, uh, Pretty Woman, starring Julia Roberts. But what Habertonon represents is the character type of the hooker with the heart of gold. And what, and, and what that means is that she is uh, a woman of lower social status, uh, but who still maintains a higher moral character outside of whatever the affiliations with her, with her social status are. Um, uh, let me think. Well, I mean, this again. This date goes back to Euripides and the and the way that Euripides uses his servant his servant characters or his slave characters and uh, gives them better moral character. This is a kind of a branch offshoot of that. Um, so Daos, the the scheming slave, we've already talked about him and with the frogs and with different plays. Uh, Habertonon, the 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 uh, flute girl, harp girl. Sorry, she's a harp girl technically. Um, uh, but she's the point is that she's a, a, a woman who's allowed to attend uh, gatherings that would otherwise be men only citizen men only because she provides entertainment citizen women would not be allowed to be there uh, and then you have uh, carry on who is the cook get used to the cook the cook is coming back the cook is always uptight um, and uh, thinks he knows more than everyone else knows uh, how much has that character type changed? I don't think very much. Um, the stat, uh, okay, so right, yes. And the, uh, right, so um, Carius ends up, of course, marrying the, the, the play ends in a marriage. So get used to that. Um, that's what's going to happen uh, basically in almost all the comedies that we read from now on. Uh, not from now on, not for in the ancient comedies that we read. It's the happy ending. It's the Oikeo Hayden way, right? It's, we can't, we're not, we're not in the stage now where we can bring um, naked girls and boys on stage and just say everybody has sex, like we did in Aristophanes. Um, now things are, are 
are, are, are sort of calmer and tamer. And, uh, and so now things end in marriages between middle class families who exchange dowries, right? They, they, they make their exchange uh, for their marriage guarantees between husband's wife and, you know, and wife's wife. Um, and then, of course, you have the, uh, uh, yeah, right. Okay. Okay, so good. So I'm done talking about Menander for just now. I, I want to come back to Alexander for just a moment. Actually, you know.